Today I want to share on, uh, I think I sent the notes on the church wall. Um, so if you have your phone, you can check. If your neighbor is not on the church wall, share with him. And then we will get the number to, to, to add on the church wall. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we want to thank God for this day. We just want to praise him for uh, that he gives us strength every day. Uh, I want us to go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. That is our theme verse. This is more of a teaching than a preaching. So there are many verses, but they are connected. One has a few. If we don't finish today, you have the notes. I'll encourage you to uh, study for yourself. There'll be a follow up message on the same topic at some point. So if you look at Revelation chapter um, 3 verse 21, it says, uh, in the New King James Version, it says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Hallelujah. So this is a message to the last church, the church of Laodicea, where the Lord says, it is given the greatest promise. He says, to those who overcome, I will grant them what? Authority or power to sit with me on my father's, on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So my message is, you can overcome as Jesus overcame. Hallelujah. Because that's what he's saying. I overcame, you can also overcome. That scripture, the, the, the word to him who overcomes. The word overcome is Nikao, where we got the name Nicholas. Anyone called Nicholas means overcome or victorious. And the Lord says it's not specific to a person, it's to anyone. To anyone who overcomes, I will do what? You will sit with me on my father's throne, on my throne, as I sat with the father on his throne. So there are verses that you're going to look at Genesis 3, 1 to 6, don't look at them. So the introduction here, there are three areas the Lord wants us to overcome, three areas. And from your notes, the first one, we have to overcome Satan. Okay, in Luke 10, 19, Jesus told his disciples, before even he went to the cross, hallelujah, before he went to the cross, he told them, behold, I give you what? the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Um, if you read the original language, there are two words there, authority and power. Okay? Authority is the, ex the God gives him a blanket, the, the right to exercise his power over the power of the enemy. And he says all the power of the enemy in all its manifestations. We have been given that authority. Now whether it's functioning in your life or not, that is your personal work with God. Yeah, All of us have that vested authority. When we get born again, Jesus said in uh, Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, he started by saying that all authority in heaven on earth has been given unto me. Therefore what? Go and make disciples of all the nations. So when he says all authority in heaven and earth has been given to the Lord, Satan has no authority today. Otherwise, but he has a lot of power. The authority Satan exercises over our lives is the authority that we give them ourselves. But he has no authority in any sphere, whether in heaven, on earth, or under the sea. The Lord took it back and he took it permanently. But because of, we have choices, just like Adam and Eve, you'll find out from today's teaching, we, we will be deceived and tempted to give back our authority to the enemy, and that's the place he's able to govern over our lives. Then he says, the other thing is, we're supposed to overcome the world, okay? It says, do not love the world or the things in the world, First John 2, 15, 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That sentence is absolute. Absolute means you cannot have both. You cannot have the love of the world and have the love of the Father. You have either. You cannot have both. 
And for me, that's a strong statement from John because it's like a warning to us where we face the challenge of the world around us. Then he says, for all that is in the world, and there are three things in the world, the last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the last of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So that means those who will do the will of God will outlast the world. The Bible says clearly, if you do the will of God, you will live forever. The world is not going to live forever. At some point, this present age will have to come to an end. This age has been running since the time Adam sinned. It doesn't mean when Adam sinned, that's when the world was created. History is counted from the time of sin, not from the time of creation. I hope you know that. Tell your neighbor to do that. The world, that's what people know, we have scientists and we have Christians on both sides who say, we teach about the young earth and the old earth. Where they say, is the earth exactly 7,000 years or is it many millions of years? We really don't know because time is counted from the time man sinned. Time is never counted what happened before. Okay? And if you read the book of uh, uh, Paul, Paul talks about it a lot and Jesus also. He talks about the ages that have gone by this present age and the ages to come. So there are ages that have gone by. I believe Adam was born not in this age. Adam was born in the previous age, whichever it was. But he sins, when he sinned, this age began. And it's the age of sin and the world system that the enemy controls. And then the other thing we need to overcome is the flesh. Okay? Matthew 16, 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me. Let him do what? Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. Deny, Jesus was very specific. The biggest challenge we'll ever face in our lives is ourselves. It's not Satan, it's ourselves. And we are going to see the last enemy to beat in your life is yourself. Satan is very easy, but yourself, the Lord will show you some things in your life that you need to overcome. The Lord will tell you what to deal in this area. So the flesh refers anything that where self-will, self-righteousness, self-satisfaction displaces God in our lives. When you feel in your life that you can make it without God, that is self-ruling. And actual self, the flesh, is where the flesh makes the final decision. So it's called, I call it self-worship. And it's very common when you read books, um, when people write books, it takes a lot of discernment to know whether they are leading you to the Lord or leading them to themselves. When you read this book of self, self-assertiveness, you have heard those books? Yes. You need to assert yourself. There is no way in the Bible it says you need to assert yourself. The Bible says crucify the flesh. When you become a Christian, you have no no will of your own. Okay? And that's why the Lord hates suggestions from human beings. It takes a lot of maturity to be able to reason with God. Okay? So I don't like those books. I read these books when I was a new believer, psychology books. They are absolutely useless to help you to become a better person. They make you very clever, but very helpless. And normally the Lord will put in an experience to prove you wrong. Hallelujah. Put in an experience, hey, it's not about you, it's about me. It's better to talk those things when you're not born again. When you're not born again, you can talk about self, asserting yourself, doing your own things. And the Bible talks about, I think Philippians, I'll just give you verses, though they're not in the notes, when Paul talks about selfish ambition. It's an ambition, but it's selfish. The, the bad part is not the ambition. The bad part is the self. Because God also has ambitions. We, God has ambitions for us. God has interests. God has purposes. Unless you embrace them, then you are running with our own selfish ambition. Whenever our will aligns with God's will for our lives, then that ambition is good. Anything else is set up. You know, Satan is very smart. 
If he had come to the Garden of Eden and told Adam, Adam and Eve, wash me, they would have refused. That was the day he then said, ah, they say, no, my friends, it doesn't work like that. So he came with a suggestion how to make them better. Hallelujah. How to make them better. So when Jesus says overcame, these are the three areas. We are going to see details. Now in the book of Revelation, there are four classes of people. Okay. Four classes of people. And all of them are on the earth today. Number one, we have those who have been already overcome. They have, they have already they have been overcome by something. Okay. And we found that in Revelation 13, verse 7 to 10. It says, talking about the Antichrist, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on earth will do what? Worship him. Whose names have not been what? Written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay. That verse, you have to go back slowly, okay? I just want to focus. He says, all who dwell what? On the earth will worship him. That sentence already has two people inside there. It is a group, the first group, he will kill them because they are the saints. Because they refuse to worship him. Okay? They will refuse. But there's a group that that was Bible says the dwellers of the earth, they will accept worship. So I remember one of God said the ultimate test we face in life is the test of worship. Who will you worship? The Antichrist may not be around us, but every day we face that day, who will you worship and serve? So these people, the first group were taken out, the saints, the war of the saints, and he overcame them. And you'll find the book of Revelation is, is this verse is causing God quoting Daniel chapter 7 to 20 to 25 where it says that the Antichrist overcame the saints. It's partial truth. Hallelujah. You have to compare scripture with scripture. There is another group of saints he will not overcome. But you are going to see there's a particular group who will be overcome. But there's another group, two groups that he will not be able to overcome, no matter the strategy he uses. So the people he overcomes are the ones he rules over. They are called the dwellers of the earth. And the dwellers of the earth, the book of Revelation, produce the kings of the earth and the merchants of the earth. Those are the three groups of the earth that time. The dwellers of the earth, the kings of the earth, and the merchants of the earth. Revelation 17, 18. And those people are overcome. They don't have an option. Then they'll gladly worship the beastly system. Then he says, the next verse, if anyone has an ear, let him hear, he who leads into captivity shall go what? Into captivity. He who kills will kill with the sword, must be killed with the sword. He has the patience and the faith of the saints. What this scripture is saying, during the Antichrist system, there will be two kinds of believers. Some will be killed, some will be taken to captivity, to prison. Okay? Not everyone is going to be killed. Okay? But there's a group he cannot even take to prison. They cannot be arrested. So, and we we'll never know who we are until we choose. Okay? Then we have the, so the first group is those who have already been overcome, overcome by the enemy. They are his. They will worship him. The second group are the outer court Christians. You'll find them in Revelation 11, 1 to 3, Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 13, 9 to 10, you have read it, and Revelation 14, 12 to 13. So we will only read Revelation 12, 17. You can go Revelation 12, 17. It says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war, what? With the rest of her offspring. And this lady has children. And those children are specific. They keep the commandments of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. The woman escaped. We are going to see the bride, the woman escape. So in, in the book of Revelation, the woman will escape. They will not be overcome. But there's a group, when the woman was taken away to be hidden in the wilderness, the enemy said, I'll come for you. Some people say this may be the Jewish people who will get saved during that time. But I believe it's not Jewish. It's any outer court Christian. Now he'll come for you. 
After God, Christians are the people who live under the world system. They love the Lord half-heartedly. They are born again, but they like playing with the world. And you never convince them. They want to have both sides. Those ones, he will come hunting for you. And those are the ones he'll kill, and some of them he'll take to captivity. He cannot take to captivity and kill those who are worshipping him. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Those who are worshipping him, they're already his. But there's a group who will be playing around games. They'll be captured, taken to prison, or killed. You'll be killed when you deny the name. These are, if you read the book of the Revelation, uh, uh, like chapter 6, chapter 20, there are many believers who will be killed and taken to heaven without their heads. Because they refuse to bow. But if you look, it's a specific group. It's not the whole of the church. Okay? Then there's the bride. The bride is Revelation chapter 12. Let's go there, verse 6, 13 to 16. I want us to read in detail this one. Revelation chapter 12, 6, 13 to 16. It says, And the dragon and the woman fled. Okay, let's start from verse 1 for context, okay? It says that uh, now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed what? With the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Because people say this is Israel, it is not true. Because Israel is already the past. John is seeing the future. So I always tell people, you cannot tell me. There's nothing revelation in the past. It's a prophecy. So this woman is, is a picture of Israel, but it's not Israel. Because we know it's not Israel because already Israel refused to believe the Lord when he came the first time. So it cannot be Israel. Israel already rejected the Lord. Until they repent, they cannot be the woman there. He says this woman was clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. So twelve, of course, represents the twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve apostles, but twelve specifically, it just represents government. It's the number for government. Whenever you see the word twelve, it's government, full government. So these are not, this, this will be the church in fullness. What does he feel? Because Jesus himself interpreted the, 12, the stars, he said the stars are what? In Revelation chapter 1, he says the stars are what? It's the angels of that local church. He, those are the only two things that Jesus interpreted himself. The last star he said is the local church, and the stars are the angels of that church. And those angels are not angels. <laughs> they are real angels, but also human beings. Because they are over a local church. One we know in the spiritual warfare, every local church has an angel assigned, a primary angel with many angels, but that angel operates through the leader. So the one angel was there is just a messenger. He says, and to this church, go give them a messenger. There's no way an angel can come and read a letter for you in church. Can you agree? Yes. So that angel was a messenger of the local church, who the letters go and read for, for them. But I'm not disputing can be a real angel, because all of these are angels, we know that. But what is happening here, the 12 stars represent the fullness of the church. What does he feel? And then you find there's a time now he talks about the 24 elders. So people say that's the church. We really don't know. But the 12 just is government, and the book of Revelation, when you read, of course I'm studying it, when you go there, you get this verse and you go to the Old Testament to find the meaning. He doesn't explain himself. I don't know how these guys, you know, John never wrote to the Jewish people, he wrote to the Gentiles. How they're able to interpret Revelation today, we we'll discuss when we reach heaven. Because obviously those people never did the Old Testament. Why how are they able to interpret that this message is for us? Then the second verse he says, then being with a child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give what? So the woman has a child that has to give it birth. Okay, the next one. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. So the fiery dragon, obviously Satan. Whenever you see, Satan has many names. He's the tempter, we're going to see. He's Satan, he's the accuser. 
He's the deceiver. Whenever I see the serpent is here, dragon means he comes to us what persecution. And he has seven heads, that means he has had seven kingdoms. And in the future he'll have ten kingdoms. Those horns and heads are the same, it's different kingdoms, okay? In, we know there have been seven empires. Remember the statue of Daniel? So there are seven. Yes, there are seven. So if you read Revelation 17, say five have happened, one is, one is not yet, and one will come. So total eight. So we know the Antichrist will be the eighth kingdom that will come from the ten nations, ten groups. Revelation 17, 18 interprets itself. Okay. So the thing is, another interpretation, seven heads means just completeness. So Satan has a complete head now. <laughs> For seven is the number of perfection. So that means this is the perfect completeness of Satan in the end times. Nothing remains. Perfect. That means he has to release everything he has in this season. Because there is another season after this. So seven normally just means completion. So there are many interpretations. Then he says, those seven heads had what? Seven, seven diadems on their heads. That means crowns. So these are kings. Okay? The word diadem is Stefano. It means a diadem, a throne, something on their head. These are rulers. Like we know that Nebuchadnezzar was a real king. That's the one who was given the mission of Daniel. So this guy is trying to interpret Daniel. Yeah. Daniel talks about us of the seven kingdoms. The ten horns we know are the ten kingdoms that will emerge before the Antichrist. Because the Bible says when he emerges, he will knock out three and take over the whole world. You know they are being formed now. I hope you know they are being formed now. So you have the African Union. So you have the European Union. We have the North American Union already. Yeah, at the moment, politically they are not one, but economically, Canada, USA, and the Mexico operate as one union because everyone in America is learning Spanish. It's required. They are allowed to travel trucks without being inspected. When you go to their airports, they talk in English and talk in Spanish. And Mexicans are the majority people who are resettled in America today because they come to work. And they're allowed to go home. So they have already joined. They're just waiting for an event to activate the North American Union. At some point, they'll have a currency. We have the Eurasian Union that is controlled by Russia. It's already there. If you read online, it's already there. Eurasian Union is already there. Then we have the China. China is their own union because one billion people, you cannot add them anymore. <laughs> so it's not be one because they are one common language. It will be one of the ten, ten regions. Then you have Australia and New Zealand. Those things were designed in 1972. The ten regions. There's a book. Ten, the, uh, if you read history, it was done in 1972. And that's the, the group that gave back to one economic forum. This guy trying to implement now. But that time it was a young man. But the 1972 group, they have a specific name, I can't remember. Uh, they, they made it wrong, so that's why they designed the world in 10 regions. Initially, South Africa was part of what? The second region, Australia, New, New Zealand. But when they got independence, they threw us together. Before that, South Africa was never part of us. That's why they don't believe we are part of them. But when they got independence in 94, now they became part of Africa. And do you know what is happening? There are weird things that are happening. Some, I just read a report. Some of the biggest banks in the world are leaving Africa. Goldman Sachs has left. Uh, Standard Chartered is leaving. Barclays has left. They are selling. Who's buying those banks? South African banks. So Barclays have become absent. So South Africa is going to dominate our economy. And that will be one of the African region. You wait, watch. One of those horns will be a South Africa. And they use war, they're going to use war and help to make sure they control us. But it doesn't mean they'll succeed. I only say that is the Satan's plan. You know the good thing I like this revelation story. It's not Satan writing the story. It is God writing the story. So the already knows what is going to happen. So he's already cooked. So when you read Revelation, don't panic. It's God writing what they are doing. I saw, I did, I saw this. So it means it means God has a plan. And then we have the region they are trying to form. From the time of the president called uh, Franco, there's a president called Sarkozy, was the president of France. During that time, they started forming the Mediterranean Union. And even announced, 
the middle of North Africa, the whole of the Middle East. So that's what they are fighting now. The goal, after this war is over, Israel is going to dominate the whole of the Middle East. Economically, no. Militarily, but Saudi Arabia will dominate what? Economically. They're already making a city. It's the largest city in the world. They're already removing the rules of keeping out non-Muslims. <laughs> They are already doing those things secret because that's one region because they have share Arabic language. And Israel is the main center, so Israel are going to play. And those things are not supposed to establish it. So if there are all this ratio, India is going to be a major, a major region. It's not. India is going to dominate that area. So if you come, they come to 10. OK, they come to 10. So those will be the 10 horns. They will choose a leader, then Antichrist will come over throw three. I already know those three. <laughs> There is this horn that is very stubborn. It uses democracy to colonize people. And they can take you out either by the carrot or by the stick you choose. When they don't like what you are doing, they start with the NGOs to overthrow you. If you don't like it, they'll shoot you dead. What is that horn called? IMF. Not IMF. The United States of America. America is the biggest implementation of one world government. If you read the books by Freemasons, there's a book called The Secret, something to the, the secret history of the United States. They're the ones that will establish the one world government. Then they'll put the capstone and then disappear as a nation. That's the secret history. Okay? And they know it. They're the ones who tell you, I don't like quicker the way you're talking. Block is a bank account, everyone knows it because they fear him. But you see, eyes have been oh, open. So guys are saying, oh, now we need to have our own currency. You hear your stories? Because this guy is coming for our money. So that's how the country, the system will be smarted. So obviously, it's known historically. Many American prophets were shown in the 1950s, I know, especially the rivalries. Um, is this American, uh, what's his name? The greatest evangelist of that time. What was his name? William Branham was shown. Is another one who was shown New York, America will end one day. So they are not, it's the current American church that doesn't believe it. But the revivals, no. It will just be for a time. Okay? There's a book written by a prophet, Mother Papara, she lived in Jerusalem. Uh, she came to Jerusalem from 1920. She ran away from Russia. I have that copy and she was told. You run to this foreign land from the Holy Land, you'll be there. There'll be, a, there'll be a scar that will be thrown on Russia, but it's not Russian soul. That was communism. Russia will become the most terrible empire, so run for your life. So she ran. Then she was told there'll be a war. They will fight until the UK will be saved by women. And the Western world, Germany, will be divided and then rejoined. America will feed the world and then it will collapse. Those prophecies, I have those things, they happen by God show, God show on that book. It's right on target because it's written 1920. Okay. So what the reason I'm saying, these kingdoms have to emerge. They're not emerging because God is sleeping. He's emerging because our Jesus is coming. They have to do their stuff, their best. This will be their best before Jesus came and showed them better. Yeah. So that's why don't worry about the end times. This will be their best they can ever produce, more than Nimrod. Nimrod was the first empire and he was an African. You know that? He was an African. So he ruled the world before. After that, he delegated to Egypt. He's the founder of Egypt, by the way, and Babylon at the same time, and many cities. So we have already, we have already had our share to rule the world. Don't worry. You know, Africans complain, these people colonize us. We already did it for a long time. Do you know how long Egypt ruled the world? From the time of Nimrod, to the time of Joe prophets, King George. Egypt was a powerful kingdom. So we have told you never you had your share. Let the people have their share. And you know, all, all times God will come and demolish it because of the gospel and because of the people of God. When you don't treat the people of God well, you go. You go. The Lord doesn't even blink. Okay, let's continue. So this is the best they can give us. There's nothing better Satan will do. So Satan did what he drew a third of the stars. That means a third of the angels. 
on heaven and threw them on the earth. That's the same thing he did before. He threw down a third of his angels. We don't know the number, but we know 200 landed on the earth. And they landed in a place called in Lebanon on Mount Hamon. Mount Hamon. When Jesus went there, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. He went to the place they landed. And that's when they started now the time of, time of Noah messing up the earth. They landed Mount Hamon is a portal. It's known, you just Google online, the people have done research. That's where the angels landed. There were 200 the leaders. And Jesus came and threatened that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Then he left. But then they say he walked for a long time. Because it was a gentle city. He took the disciples, threatened them, then left. And the church is supposed to implement those things. So when Satan throws these, he throws them on the earth. Tell your neighbor he throws them on the earth. They are here. <laughs> okay, the leaders have been tied in everlasting chains, but their work is still going on. So Satan is not going anywhere. Okay? Then he says that the drunkards took what? Before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So people say this is Jesus. You know this scripture can apply to Moses. It can apply to Jesus. It can apply to the church. The woman represents and um, you know in the Bible is very quite careful. Eh? When it one talks about about woman, what does it call them? The hallows. When it talks about the woman, it's talking about the righteous. Israel is called the daughter of Israel. So here, this child, they want to give this child and certainly saying, I'm going to devour you. He has done it twice, it failed. Moses it failed. The first infanticide or genocide happened in the time of Moses. We know when they say all the boys will be king. It's called infanticide or genocide. The second time was the time of Jesus. So genocide is not something new. It's always going to become a threat to the ruling powers. Then they, they say the only way is let's kill all of them. All of them. And they always look for men. Yeah, women are captured. They become someone's wife. <laughs> That's his story. Why? Because you know why the enemy is always doing like that? They never know who will be the Messiah. And they never know who will be the deliverer. But normally you notice, uh, the second Peter says, the Lord knows the deliverer those who are righteous. Before the genocide happens, it is proven historically, the Lord will tell people, move out quickly. It happened Moses' time, Jesus' time. It happened the Armenian genocide, 1915. There's a whole village, a prophet, a young child, told people when it happens, you run away to go the land to the west. All of them moved to the United States of America before the genocide happened. 1.5 million Armenians were killed by the Turkish people. But before it happened, there's this young child prophet who told them, get out. Second World War, those who had the opportunity knew. They were told, get out. Even the Jewish people, they were told to get out. If you read 1973 war in Israel, believers were warned, prepare. So the Lord, through the prophetic ministry, he will warn people, get up. Something worse is coming, okay? So this one, this child is rescued by the Lord. Let's go to verse five, okay? I'm teaching two things at the same time. So you have this child and you have the woman, okay? I said, she bore a male child to rule what? Nations with the iron rod. And her child was caught up to heaven. So it's true, it's Jesus. But also, it's not Jesus alone. Jesus was given the rod of iron to rule the nations. But it says in, um, in Revelation, one of the churches, I think, one of the churches is promised that those who overcome shall rule the nations with an iron rod. So there's an overcoming group that will rule with Jesus. So it's not Jesus alone. Jesus is already on the throne. Why would you say that? You know, those people say it's referring to Jesus. Why would you prophesy and it has already happened? He was already on the throne. So it's referring to another group. These are called the overcomers. In the Old Testament, they're called the remnants, the overcomers, or the sons of God. Those are the three names. In the Old Testament, they're called the remnant. God has always had a remnant. And they're normally almost 10% of the general population of believers. Okay? So he's caught up on the throne. So this is the third group, the fourth group you're going to see. Let's continue. So let's talk about the bride. 
Now, the, when the woman, the son was taken to the throne, what happens? The woman was taken where? Into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by who? Tell your neighbor, it is not you preparing the place. It is God. So it must be the safest place. Amen. There is no way Satan can catch those people. And it says that they should be, they should feed her there. Who, sh who should, who, who is the day and her? If you know English. They, who is who's going to feed the bride in the wilderness? The sons of God. Those who are taken to the throne. They are called, another name they have is the friend of the bridegroom. They take care of the bride. There's a group of the church being raised up to take care of the bride. And they know themselves. They look like you, but also they don't look like you. They are flesh and blood, but there's something they can. And some of them already know those assignments. And they're the ones, that group, they will be tested. So the testing we are going through, we don't know whether you qualify to be the bride or the sons of God. Just make sure you go through the test. Because you never know until you reach the other side. Like John the Baptist, he said, I'm the friend of the bridegroom that came to help Jesus, the bridegroom will receive her bride. And I've finished my work. And he says, I'm happy to hear the voice of the bridegroom. These are people, the sons of God are the people who rejoice to hear the voice of the bridegroom. It's never about them. It's always about the bridegroom. Some of them have no ministries. Their pub ministries are not public. But they know who they are. They don't have even have a name. But they glorify the name of the Lord. And their work is to take care of the church. Because the church, this is a scripture from Isaiah, where it says, when you go to the wilderness, I'll give you water and I'll feed you there. So John is saying that. And they'll be there for how many days? 1,000. 260 days, three and a half years. So the church is not going anywhere. When I was young, we used to be told the church will be raptured. No, it says the church will be taken to the wilderness. The wilderness is everywhere. It's not Sahara Desert. It's everywhere. There are places God is going to hide believers with their eyes open, and you never see them. They will be protected by the Lord. Some of them will be in Kitengela. I know one of them is a senior, because I was told a few years ago. There are places the Lord said there will be protection for people. Kenya is supposed to be a refugee nation. So that's what I'm saying. No matter what our politicians do, if they don't cooperate, they'll be thrown out. It will not work. Some of them use the name of the Lord to reach the throne. It has always happened from history. When you reach the throne, they betray you. The Lord says, next. Until you get the generation that will do it. What has he feared? So I always say 2027 is coming, 2032 is coming. And I always say, even if you don't vote, tell your neighbor, if you don't vote, God still has options. God doesn't vote. No, there are things I know in history when God wants to raise up my Mikhail Gorbachev. Mikhail Gorbachev, the last ruler of Russia, was raised up by an orthodox Christian mother. So he was a communist. He became the secretary general of the country, but he had a godly heritage. And if you read the history, it was God. Because prophets have been told in 19, seven years before 1989, that was 1982, uh, there's this guy who wrote Smogler's book. Many people are told, I'm giving Russia seven years, I will start releasing my people. So what Gorbachev, when he came to power, the first people released the Jewish people to go home. He fulfilled Isaiah, I'll bring my people from the north. He released them, he suicide and agreed, go home, go home. Then the Lord brought the whole thing crumbling down, without firing a, a blade. Do you know what happened before? There were three rulers of Russia before that. All of them died in office. So I always say, tell God, God has all options. He doesn't need a vote to get the right person there. Three rulers died. One after the other, two people got scared in Russia. But when God got the right guy, he stayed and did what God said, say. So I have never worried the destiny about our nation. What you know and say in missions, if we don't do it peacefully, we lead by war, but it still happen. 
So choose. 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 There's a lot of discipline that is going to come with this country. Very, very soon. And in this government. Because of things they have done. I can tell you, number one, the DP and the president, when they were campaigning, I went to the Attorney General's office myself. This is not something I had in the air. They told us, you came here to refuse to register churches. You know that? Mm -hmm. Prophet Konage knows, even and asked the Attorney General, why not say we cannot? When they were campaigning, all of them said, we'll register church. churches. They have refused to register churches. So because they refused to keep a promise to simple pastors in the village, God will remember them. And they were voted for, saying, but then they have blocked it. They are using Shakahola. Are we Shakahola? <laughs> That's the excuse they are using. Please, you promised the church you register churches. Register them. You can never supervise what you cannot register. So long as you don't register these churches, you never supervise what they are doing. Registration is accountability. They have refused. I got a pastor told me they have refused. They have forgotten their promises to God. They have forgotten. But God, we have not forgotten. Never has gone. And they did it in the name of Christ. They came to churches and were prayed for. Laid hands on many times. We don't want you to go. You can never walk the living God. I wish they had not come to church for prayer. <laughs> but you see what I'm trying to say, when God says 1,200, if the day is, Satan is not going to rule this world one minute extra. <laughs> These are Jewish months, it'd be 1,260 days to the day and minute. Then Jesus arrives from heaven. But within those three and a half years, you see things on this earth, Jesus said, if those days were not shorter, no one will escape. The Lord will give the world an opportunity to be ruled by Satan himself. Because he have refused to be ruled by the Lord for 6,000 years. He did them three and a half years. Hey, my friend, you will cry out for the living God. Jesus says they will look for death, but they will not find it. Because everyone wants an experiment. Everyone wants a trial. You know, I've heard people say, I wish I was a servant of Satan. Hmm? They have an opportunity for 1,260 <laughs> days. But God's people will not be part of that system. They charge, let me tell you, they charge to be hidden in the wilderness. The true Israel, the wilderness is in Jordan today in the mountains, Petra. The Jewish people will be hidden in Petra. But the church all over the world will be hidden in wilderness somewhere. The church will be here because we need to reach people, we need to evangelize. One of the few words. And people will get saved in millions. Yeah. So next verse. Have you agreed the church is here? They will be hidden. So don't listen. Those people say we will be raptured. Okay. Then he says, and war broke out where? In heaven. And Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and angels fought. Okay. In the next verse. But they did not what? Prevail. Start a nice sentence. Satan will never prevail here. Nor was a place found in him in hell. The day of accusing the church will be over. Any longer. Then he says the next one is. So the great dragon was cast out. Now these are his names. The great dragon, the serpent of the world, the devil, Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast where? Tell your name by the earth. <laughs> <laughs> so what is happening? Uh, if you read uh, most of them, they say God has had seven places of his presence from the Garden of Eden. Satan also has his places. He was in the highest heaven. He was cast out to the second heaven. Now this one is removed from the second heaven to the earth. And then from the earth to the level of fire. So there are stages. God is merciful. <laughs> Because he could have thrown him the first time. Yes. But he says, from, from my throne, go down there. Second heaven. Then to the earth for three and a half years. Then lake of fire. Not that Satan cannot be forgiven. He can't. But people should never say God is unjust. He gives him time. 
Okay? They will never repent. Those people will never repent. But for justice to prevail, the Lord cannot do it quickly. He has to go stage by stage. So he's thrown on the earth. His angels are cast with him. Now, all the, all the angels in the prison, the ones in the principalities, the ones who are still running. Also, I learned, they land on earth. Now, that's how you start seeing vampires. You've seen vampires. Dra Dracula, you know Dracula? Those people are coming. Many prophets have been shown. Aliens are coming. Aliens are not angels, they are demons. There's a prophet who has shown all those things you watch on movies. Aliens, Dracula's dragons are coming on the earth, you see. And the church, the Lord told him, and the church has to overcome them also. The son of Levi Johnson, he was shown. The church has to overcome them. If you don't overcome Satan, the Lord failed in his work. Shetani had to escape this time. The church has to open. So when he's thrown on the earth, let's continue. There'll be a shout in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the powers of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night. That sentence, day and night. It's all. For this season, he's allowed to accuse us. But day is coming, the Lord said, I don't want you to think, walk around. Don't come and walk in my presence. Then he says the next verse. And they overcame what? The believers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives unto a death. So in the next message, you'll see the five keys how to overcome. Two of them are here. One of them is the blood, one is the word, other the other keys Jesus gave. Therefore rejoice what? Heavens. You who dwell in them. So the angels will be saying, Hallelujah. The guy is gone. <laughs> but the earth will be saying, Woe unto us. The earth will be saying, Woe unto us. And he says, It's specific. The inhabitants of the earth and the sea. But those are the dwellers of the earth, those who are not born again. Do you know they start making noise when they see Satan has arrived? For the devil has come down to you, <laughs> having what? Okay. Great wrath, because he knows what? He has a shot. You see, what people don't understand, the day he's thrown, it's exactly 1,260 days. He cannot add or subtract. See, he'll have his time to his games, but you'll find he will lose the kingdom, literally. By the end of the, of the session, after going to get him back. Jesus will never leave this earth to the enemy. Please. The earth belongs to them. No. So he will make sure at the end of three and a half years, Anakitu, but he will use the church in the wilderness, the sons of God, to do a lot of work on this earth. The next one, I'm trying to explain. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted what? The woman who came back to the male church. Now he comes for the church. And the Bible says he'll be persecuted. But what does God do? The next verse he said, God provides a solution. Verse 13. 15. So let's go to verse. So the serpent what? Spewed water out of his mouth like a flood. Flood of in the Bible, flood can represent war. War or perse massive persecution. After the woman. The good thing it was after the woman, not before her. So she was running and it was behind. Behind. That he might cause her to, to be carried out by the flood of persecution and all those things. But what happened, verse 16? But the earth, what? You need to know, the earth hears a voice. The earth will say, we need to have the brand. And the earth opened its mouth <laughs> and swallowed the flood, which the dragon. There is something the Lord will do to the devil. He will not like him. Even the earth will deny him. Then the next verse, he says what? And the dragon was now angry because he couldn't catch her. So he went to make war against who? The rest of her offspring. Those are the outer court Christians. Either you're part of the sons of God, the bride, or these, these guys will go. Because the woman will never be gone. Okay? Actually, there's a scripture saying that she was given wings. I think verse 14 in John. She was given wings to run away. Wings. Uh, can you go to verse 14? Yes. But the woman was given what? Two wings of a great eagle. Now, 
in the spiritual, there is the general egos and the white egos. Egos represent the prophetic ministry and the Lord himself. The Lord will give the church a powerful prophetic ministry where they will do great things and they will never catch that woman. And the first thing is, she might fly where? She didn't walk to the wilderness. She flew. Okay? To her place. There is a place prepared for her where she is what? No. Nourished. That means taken care of for a time, times and half a time from the presence of Satan. Satan will not be there. I hope you're following me. Then Satan will not be in those places. For three and a half years, the church will be protected. The one nourished there is the same one we use in Ephesians chapter 5, that husbands care and nourish your wife. It's the same one. Because this is the bride. The Lord has to care for his church. And to make sure the enemy is not there. These verses have really encouraged me. You know, I wish I, someone taught this when I was younger. We would have never lived in fear. Because it says, from the presence of serp the serpent, that means the one there serpent, the deceiver, the church will not be deceived that time. They will never be deceived. Because the bride will be focused waiting for the bridegroom. Okay? Have you understood? So those are the four classes of people. We have those who have been overcome by Satan, the outer court Christians, the bride, and the overcomers. So let's go to Genesis 3. I think we have some 15 minutes. Genesis 3, 1 to 7. Adam and Eve failed the test to overcome. So let's see how they failed. Genesis 3, okay? Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Amen. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? That sentence is wrong. God never said you cannot eat any tree. God was specific to one tree. So Saturday added his words. When you want to do discernment, Satan adds his own thing. And if you don't know what is written, he will add. Do you know all denominations? All denominations. I will tell you the truth. None of them has the truth alone. All of them have error. All of them. None of them are innocent. Because if all of us believe the same thing, there will be no denominations. But someone adds something. Or they hear something new from the Lord. And the Lord says, add this one. Which the Lord is always adding. So that's all they say. This scripture teaches us, at the moment, the church has truth and error at the same time. It has the wheat and the tares at the same. And don't approve the tares. You will remove the wheat. Just relax. <laughs> Because when he that said that you shall not eat any of your tree, the Lord did not say such a thing. Do you know the garden was a specific place? Yeah, it was not just a normal garden. Then let's go. I don't want to teach about those one today. Let's go. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat any the fruit of the trees of the garden. See, she corrected him. We are allowed to eat. Then next one. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it. Now she added her own words. God never said, don't touch it. <laughs> See, it's the tree, you can touch it, but don't eat, eat it. Then the serpent said to her, you shall not surely die, which was a lie. God had told her, you know, who was given these commandments? Adam, was he there? So why did she learn all the things from Adam? So Adam was either a poor teacher. What's <laughs> kidding? Because why was she adding those things? Okay. Adam, God they told Adam, you'll die. Okay, next. Adam has to go. For God knows that the day in the day you eat of eat, what will happen? Your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. That's a wonderful promise. All of us must be God. But you cannot be God by disobeying him. You become God like God by following him. Please listen to me. Satan is always telling you, you can become God by breaking the command. God said you become like God, like Christ, by following him. The image is put in us as we follow Jesus. The truth of the matter is, people may not like this, but this 
season we can say. 1990s, if you said you are run out of church. Okay? But these days, it makes sense. Why did Jesus become the Son of Man? Why did he become the Son of Man? He that was God, why did he become like us? So that you may make man to be like God. Please. He, when we come to Christ, we become sons of God. That's the truth. Don't deny it. Tell your neighbor, don't deny it. Jesus said himself, to those who believed him, he gave them the right to become what? The sons of God. But it doesn't mean we know everything. But there's a part of God we can carry. His image and his likeness. But it doesn't mean we know everything. Okay? So these days, 1990s, you say like that, people run out of church. You're saying now we are God. No. We are just saying Jesus died to make us like him. Because God lost sons. And he wanted them back home. Okay. If you argue that, go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. It says he became like us, that he may bring many sons to glory. Many. Okay? So Satan doesn't tell you the truth. Then he says, so the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that's the last of the flesh. That it was pleasant to the eyes, the last of the eyes. And it was desirable to make one wise, to be like God. Pride of life. So they were tested. So when they failed the test, you know, after she ate, she gave to, and he ate it. It's unfortunate. <laughs> but it happened. It happened. So what I'm trying to say, this is the same test Jesus faced. Let's, let's go to the test Jesus first. I'm going quickly. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. Jesus faced the same test, by the way. Same test. Matthew 4, 1 to 11. So, and Jesus was led by the Spirit into the? Tell your neighbor, the wilderness is a good place. The woman is taken to the wilderness to be protected, and Jesus is also taken to them. And he was taken by who? The Holy Spirit. So, God will allow us to go dry seasons to train us. It doesn't mean it's punishment. But you need to know why you're in the wilderness. If you ever see yourself in the wilderness, know there is always a promised land. So don't live in the wilderness. Always have hope and desire to go where the Lord is leading you. Don't make the wilderness your home. Wilderness, you don't sleep there, you walk. Is the not supposed to walk through? Yes, you don't make it comfortable and start saying, I want talking bars and watermelons. <laughs> no, no. Keep on walking to the pro promised land. I'm trying to communicate something here. The day of luck doesn't mean the day of plenty will never come. Please. It's just a test. The Lord desires his children to have everything. When you reach the promised land, everything comes. But in the wilderness, you have to be tested so that the Lord can know where is your heart. Okay? So Jesus was led to the, by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted. The most powerful thing Satan does to us before deception is temptation. It's like temptation and deception come together. But there are two types of demons. One is the help of the other one. You no know, temptation is a person, okay? And around, and Amanda was shown, she made temptation, it's a person. It's a very, the Lord told her, this is the most powerful demon that the church has ignored. Temptation. Because the work of temptation is to trap you, then deception can work on you. <laughs> like he told Eve, uh, if, if you eat, you'll bite like God. She, and at attention. Until that time, if Eve had refused the fruit, she'd be okay. But when she ate, case ate, ended. So the enemy would whisper things to us. You can't stop him, but you can say to say, no, I will not agree, okay? So let's continue. And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. So the temptation number three starts. Now when the tempter came, he said, if you are the son of God, you know that's already doubt. You must say, well, you are the son of God. If you are really the son of God, command these thoughts to become bread. Because he was hungry. The Bible says the previous verse he was hungry. He had fasted for 40 days, now he needed food. So the enemy tells him, there is food. You are the son of God, just make the food. It was destined to satisfy his hunger without God's provision. 
And you see this test when Jesus was tested. Who came to feed him? The angels. So the food was there. But Satan wanted him to give him food before the real food. Because I you know when the angels brought food, they didn't bring Madame. I know it. They never brought Gideon. They brought angels food. Food. But Satan was trying to give him food before the real food. Tell him, hey, but there is always food before the real food. The enemy will always tell you an option before God tells you this is the permission. What did Jesus say? No. He said, What? Man shall not live what? By bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. Jesus is saying, Me, I wait on the word of God. I don't wait on bread. I'm alive because the Lord has spoken, not because I ate. You were already fasted for 40 days. Next one. Okay. Then the devil took him what? This scripture. I hope your eyes will be open then. You know, someone was telling me I'm teaching difficult things. <laughs> this is very difficult. <laughs> Satan picks Jesus, the Son of God, and transports him to a place. What about you? <laughs> You know, people say, oh, Satan can do some things. You have no clue what you are saying. See, he picked Jesus yes. and took him to the holy city. Yes. He was in the wilderness of Judea. Picked him nicely and took him to the temple. So, you can also be carried. Please believe me. Never reach a point to say Satan cannot do some good to you. He can. If he did to Jesus, you know, when I read this verse yesterday, I was like, hmm, hmm, hmm. So this is supernatural transportation to Jesus. The means of transport is Satan himself, not Jesus. You see my problem? If you don't see my that problem, we have another problem with you. Satan can provide supernatural transport. Attention. He picked him. I don't know that he carried his hair. He gave him a chariot. We don't know the details. But Jesus arrived in the temple. So Satan can give you. So there is supernatural transportation. Stop telling people those things are not true. What was Satan doing? And if Satan can do it, you know, to the Son of God, that means Jesus has wings. <laughs> Jesus has wings to fly. So all of us have wings to fly. Wait, the Lord will do some things to you. You know, I hear people say, oh, it can't happen. That scripture is not good. But it encourages us, there's a possibility. Either to be transported by the enemy or by God. And all of them is there. It's financial transportation. It just matters who's carrying it. <laughs> That's all we need to find out. Let's stop arguing there's nothing as financial transportation. It is there, but who is carrying you? Yes. You mean here yeah, about it? Yes. I, I told someone, I'll teach them. These things are always known, but I'm like afraid. If you go and teach in a theological school, there's certain carrying Jesus. <laughs> They tell you you're a bad student, get out. But what is happening here? Okay? And he put him not in the temple inside. He put him on top there. Satan has bad manners. He takes the Son of God and puts him in the highest place. Then he starts the interview, okay? Let's continue. And he said to him, if you are the Son of God, every time it's about his identity. If you are the Son of God. Was Jesus the Son of God? Yes. So the enemy will always fight your identity. Who are you? Then he told him, throw yourself down, for it is real, that he shall give, God shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot on a stone. Was the scripture correct? Yes. Psalms 91, it's there. So the Satan knows the Bible. But was the motive right? No. So what is the discernment I will say it again. This man starts by knowing the word. But if you only know the word without the Holy Spirit, Satan will deceive you. Because he can give you a scripture to kill your children. The Bible says, and the women ate their children. Is it not written? Yes. And if you say you're eating your children, you say it is written. But is that God? No. I'm trying to help you. All false religions started when we quoting scripture. But you have to know the context and why God said it. God is not a cannibal, so he doesn't eat people. But it's written the HG. 
And is that place inspired? Yes. <laughs> you know, professor saying there are some scriptures. It is inspired, but don't do it. Don't do it. It's inspired, but don't do it because that's not like God. Okay, so behind the scripture is the spirit of scripture, the Holy Spirit interpreting. Okay, then he told him, okay. Okay, let's continue. And Jesus said to him, it is written, you shall not what? Tempt the Lord. The Lord told him, I will not tempt the Father to come and do what? Throw myself down so he can send his angels. I'm a son. I can go down myself. Why does the Son of God need angels? He doesn't need. Have you understood? Yeah. Jesus said, I don't need the angels. I created those angels. So why do I need their transport? So I can go down myself. Get lost. When you know your identity, you need, don't need the help of angels. Oh, I know that I'm past. Because angels are created beings. You are created in the image of God. There's something we carry greater than angels. So don't trust the Lord. God send angels to come and feed me. Or God feed me. God tell you, you're not a bad. Get out of this house. Because <laughs> the scripture says, he feeds the man. I didn't say you do the same. You get out of the house, go and work. Bars don't even. I remember the Johnson was talking about that. When the chicken, you see, they got told the, the, the Johnson, the hardest working animal on this earth is the chicken. Do you know it's true? When they, when they wake up, they start eating. Even if they are full, they eat. So tell them, but you're not a chicken. They work. A chicken can never say I'm satisfied. At least a cow will say I'm satisfied and sleep. But a chicken, they will eat until the thing is. They eat as if there's no tomorrow. Hallelujah. But we are not chickens, we are human beings. So there are things we cannot copy. One as if you were. So, then the number three. So the second test was what? First, that test was the pride of life. Throw yourself down. You come and rescue. He said, No, I can never tempt the Lord. So he took him the third test. And the devil took him what? Another spiritual transporter to the exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kings of the world. Where was this mountain? It's not Mount Everest. This mountain in the spirit. But Satan gave him supernatural transport. Another transport. <laughs> and then this one was even worse. You know, at least the temple, he could see it. But that mountain, to see the whole world, how did Jesus do know it? No, Jesus was here. So Satan is a seer. Okay? The next verse, what did he tell him? And he said to him, All these things I'll give you if you will. So, he, was it a lie or not? Ask the neighbor, was it true or not? It is true. That thing is true. Up to that point, Satan controlled him. Because when Adam gave the keys, he gave the title D to everything. So Satan, Jesus came to stop him. Please believe me, until Jesus came, Satan had a right over, he was called the prince of the air, the rule of this one, the rule of this present age. He is in charge. When you give him the keys, he's in charge. So he was not lying to him. People say he was lying, he was not lying. If he was lying, why did Jesus answer him? But you see, when he showed him, this I learned from Prophet Doug Addison. Okay, Prophet Doug Addison is a Hollywood prophet. He works in Hollywood, okay? He used to minister to Hollywood stars. Dream interpretation and their tattoos, and he, was a, he has a very successful ministry. He's one of the prophets that encouraged me the power of online ministry, okay? He had no money. He was broke, totally broke. A good prophet in Hollywood. Imagine he lives among money, but he's broke. So God told him, you are an IT expert. I wanted to start an online ministry to reach people. So he started. Got a house, started ministering online. He reaches one million people per month. He is no longer broke. And all he teaches people is dream interpretation. One, one of his books, I, I, I bought one of his courses, and he said, this is a proof. This is a proof. If Satan can show a vision to Satan, to Jesus, he, Satan can show you a vision. 
so, I can say this idea of telling people, oh, this is the vision from Satan is bad. No, Jesus saw a bit. But in that vision, Jesus still said, no. And he said, one of the things you need to know when you have bad dreams, why does the Lord allow you to see bad dreams? Because there's a reason. Why did God the Father allow Satan to show Jesus a bad vision? That's what I'm asking of one. There was a reason in it. So you're saying bad dreams are not bad. He said also the bad dreams interpret them well. And then he has a principle, whatever Satan is chasing in a dream, that's your destiny. So you see like Jesus, he told him, if you worship me, I'll give you a... That was the destiny of Jesus, to own everything. So Jesus, he told Jesus, no, and Satan, no. I'll go the path of the Father, but I'll get everything back. When Jesus rose from the dead, he got everything. The Father said, I give you all authority. So this principle teaches us, you will get everything as a son, but you don't have to follow what Satan is saying. Those things that those, the sons inherit. So the inheritance is yours, but you don't have to follow his enemy. Just follow the Lord. That's all. You will still get it. But if you do the shortcut, hey, Jesus bound my friend. Hey, me, I can describe what my mind is saying. Oh, brother, please excuse me. Already had a problem. Satan has repaired. <laughs> and there's caused a lot of problems in heaven has been thrown down. Now the very being of God himself has repaired. What will happen? God will have lost his kingdom forever. <laughs> but God cannot deny himself. So Satan, this test, it doesn't mean Satan, he was not going to succeed because Jesus had not seen. He had nothing of the sinful this world, so it was possible for him to obey 100%. And that's why Jesus, we need Jesus as Savior, so that to help us to do what we can never do as human beings. But this, I'm teaching this, listen to me. You can see a bad vision and a bad dream. Don't start cursing God. Tell God, why am I seeing bad dreams? Whatever the message is there is your destiny. If you see someone chasing you, you see these dreams, people are chasing you or drowning you in the sea, ask the guy, why are you chasing me? Whatever they tell you, that's your destiny. You go the opposite side. Your enemy always go the opposite side. You never run away from the enemy. Another thing also Jesus is teaching us here, you never respond to the enemy, you respond only to the Lord. Only to them. Because the enemy, will tell, the enemy will tell you a lot of stuff. Don't agree. Finally, Jesus overcame in three areas. So this one will do very quickly. So now he was tested there. He overcame by the word, by the many principles there. But now let's see the scriptures Jesus overcame. Number one, John 12 verse 31, Jesus overcame Satan. It's written in the Bible. And he overcame Satan before he died. John 12, 31. Okay. I'll just read the scriptures because of time, okay? John 12, and Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. Now the rule of this world will be what? Cast out. So Satan, when Jesus died on the uh, cross, he gave him a final notice, you're getting out. People think that Jesus will throw out Satan at the end times. He did it at the cross, my friend. Now is the time of battle. This is the time for the church to fall. But the battle has already been settled. We may lose battles, but the war is done. The guy is finished. The next one, Jesus overcame the world. Jesus, in John 16, verse 33, Jesus says himself, I have overcome the world. John 16, verse 33, quickly. He says, these things are spoken to you, that in me you may have what? Peace. In the world, you'll have what? Tribulation. Tell your neighbor, there is trouble in this world. Wake up. Because <laughs> some people will imagine, God, I have to be in a genie, we have peace. The Lord says, peace is only in me. In me. Outside there, you can buy it. Then he says what? But be of a good cheer, I've done what? I have overcome the world. He has overcome the world. Not in the future. This is called past present, no, past present tense. Past perfect tense. It has already happened. And this was before the cross. 
Another one, the last one, Jesus has overcome the flesh. John 14, verse 13. John 14, verse 13, Jesus has overcome the flesh. And that's what he did before he reached the cross. I'm trying to pass a point. Jesus did not go to the cross to die for himself. He had to overcome these things before he reached the cross to be a perfect sacrifice. Okay? He says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the rule of this world is come. And what? He has what? Nothing. This is what I did pray for myself. God, bring me to a place the enemy has nothing in me. You know, outside you can have things against you. But if there's nothing in you of the enemy, the world cannot have anything for you. The biggest thing you need to overcome is to make sure in me only Jesus knows. Every cell, every proton, every electron in me should just worship the Lord. There should never be discordance and disharmony. That one is worshiping Satan and worshiping, worshiping myself. Everything must align to worship the Lord so that the enemy has nothing. Nothing. For, for you guys. Unless if you If Jesus did, he says, I overcame you also will over. So number one, how do you respond to this message? Number one, learn from his example. Luke 12, Jesus says, looking up to Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. Please let me tell you, there is help here. There is no temptation or challenge you never go through that the Lord never went through. The focus should be always on the Lord. Stop focusing on our problems and our challenges. Focus on the Lord. There is power in what you focus on. If you focus on darkness, you become very dark. If you focus on light, you start glowing. Focus on the Lord. Things will happen around us. Jesus endured this stuff for us. Make sure you focus to him. Number two, trust him. That is Hebrews 2, 8, 17 and 18. It says, therefore in all things he has he was made to be like his brethren, like us, that he might become merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself suffered, being tempted, he is able to help those who are being what? Tempted. Ask for help. Tell the Lord, I need help. Okay? Number three, the last one, live and serve in his victory. Those scriptures are very powerful. I just read for you, it says, Romans 8, 35, 37, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter, yet in all these things we are what? More than conquerors, through him who loved us. Remember, it is through him, it's not our strength. One of the things when I was praying about this message, you have to come to the end of yourself. It's only through the Lord. Stop trusting in yourself. There is nothing good in you. There's nothing good in me. First Corinthians 15, verse 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us what? The victory through Jesus Christ. The victory is given. So we don't have to live a life of defeat. Then when the last one, Second Corinthians 2, 14, Now thanks be to God who always leads us what? In triumph in Christ. So the victory is in Christ. We will overcome. Don't write yourself off. Hallelujah. Don't. When I see you, I want us to stand up. Don't write yourself off. There is no challenge that Jesus never faced. And he never overcame. We must know he's not just an example, but the victory got on the cross over the flesh, over the, the world. He did it for us. We don't have to manufacture our own victory. We just trust in him that he'll work in us. The next message, I don't want to teach it, but it will show you more the practical part. You have to reach the place of Galatians 2.30. I no longer live. Christ lives in me by the faith of the Son of God. It's not even your faith. It is his faith. It's no longer your life. It's life. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to thank you. Thank you for the promise in Revelation 3.21 that Lord, you say, just as you overcame, 
we can also overcome through you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I want to pray for all of us here. We pray for the body of Christ worldwide. In this season of challenges and difficulties, Holy Spirit, help us to be overcomers. Lord, give us keys, things you can apply in our lives to be overcomers in every area of our lives. We pray that, Lord, the overcoming church shall rise up in every nation, in every people group, in every language group. The victorious church, the glorious church, the perfect church. Lord, the church that is one in the Lord, that, Father, we shall be part of it, Lord. I want to pray for all of us that, Lord, are feeling weak in ourselves. Holy Spirit, we pray for an impartation of the spirit of victory. Lord, that we shall be able to overcome through the Lord. Father, we bind the spirit of defeat in our lives where we feel that, Lord, we can never make it. We renounce that lie of Satan in the name of Jesus. We bind the spirit of defeat and, Lord, release the spirit of victory in us to walk in the victory and the triumph of Christ on a daily basis of God. So we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. For in Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. Amen.